You're listening to the Modern Therapist Survival Guide, where therapists live, breathe, and practice as human beings. To support you as a whole person and a therapist, here are your hosts, Kurt Widhelm and Katie Vernoy. Welcome back, Modern Therapists. This is the Modern Therapist Survival Guide. I'm Kurt Whithelm with Katie Vernoy, and this is the podcast that talks about all things therapy, therapists related. And now I think we're just hitting that inception level of how to do therapy for therapists. <laughs> and we have had previous episodes talking about therapists getting therapy, but we have a request from a listener from Australia who has reached out to us and said that she has experienced some attempts to seek out therapy herself and has found that some of the therapists that she's gone to have been ill-prepared for having a therapist as a client. And she also mentioned that she had had some therapists in her family sessions and felt a little ill-prepared herself. So we are diving deep into the therapist as a client, but from the therapist chair end of this conversation. And in preparing for this episode, when you type into Google therapists in therapy, it doesn't provide any sort of beneficial <laughs> results that talks about maybe you should go to therapy. It talks about that therapists also can get therapy, but there really doesn't seem to be a lot of ideas at all about how to do therapy with a therapist client. And so Katie and I had some discussions around this and our experiences of having therapists come into our offices and in some of the, the conversations that we've had with some other colleagues. And that's what we're planning on bringing here today. Potentially one of the reasons that there's not a lot of research or Googleable comments about therapists as clients in therapy is that the premise that there would be is that we would be different from other types of clients. And so to me, I think there's a piece of this where the expectation that we would be different clients may be overstated. And the way that Katie and I have kind of come to this idea is as therapists, we don't really consider that a therapist might come to us. And there are people out there who specialize as therapists for therapists. But at our most basic level, this makes us really look at why, what is somebody coming to therapy for? What are they hoping to get out of it? These are questions that are the same regardless of who comes to your office. Yes. Like what, is, what is the ultimate goal here? There's an assumption that when therapists come into therapy that they're going to be different than other clients. And I think that this comes across in a, in a handful of different ways. Number one is the therapist is coming to me, I'm going to assume that they know at least some of the basics a little bit more. But during the assessment process, I kind of want to have an understanding of exactly where they're coming from. Sure. In some people, the reason that they're coming to therapy is dealing with their own therapeutic work and their job place issues. And some people might be coming for entirely non-job related things. And I think that that's going to steer your discussion a little bit differently with your therapist clients. But I think that there's also a point where in the therapeutic relationship is clients in general tend to test boundaries. Yes. And what we as therapists can fall into the trap of is expecting our therapist clients to not behave like therapy clients. <laughs> Actually, that is, uh, I think, pretty accurate. <laughs> what this sets us up as therapists is that we're expecting them to both know more and be better behaved than, and be less boundary pushing, more mm -hmm. respectful of the therapeutic process without actually bringing that therapeutic alliance issue up and really making that connection very verbal, very overt and very agreed upon. So that way the work can be moved through well together. And I think that the expectation that we will be slightly different clients is not unfounded. It's just not a hundred percent accurate. I think when I, when I think about the therapist clients I've had, as well as myself as a therapy client, 
I think there are things where the discussion around the therapeutic alliance, for example, was much more overt than I've done with my clients who are not therapists. I've done some education with some of my clients so they could have that conversation. But with therapists, there is a little bit of a shorthand that can happen where the expectation that they're going to be kind of easier clients that are going to test less, that kind of stuff can be accurate. I think the difficulty is that if we expect that and we act on that assumption, then we're not actually seeing the person in the room. We're seeing them from their job title. And I think that can be very short-sighted and I think it can lead to a tension that can be felt as competition. It can be felt as distrust I know my own therapist had said that, you know, she's felt that competition in the room. I think that I have felt it in the past, just kind of this, this notion of, is this person seeing me in a different way than other clients would? Do I have something new to offer to this therapist since they know stuff and they're not doing it? And we've talked about that in a recent episode. I think it's, it's something where when we make an assumption based on some category, when someone walks in the room, I think it it hinders us in the work regardless. On this competition piece too is this brings up a lot of of vulnerability but it also heightens that mistrust of what the relationship is going to be from the very beginning because especially for a, a therapist who has not worked with a therapist client before mm-hmm. there's an internal thought process that goes along with Are they going to see that I don't know something? And Mm -hmm. it just brings that imposter syndrome right back up. And so when we get put into that position, we can oftentimes just seek out the safety of the basics of therapy, the things that we are better at, that we better understand. The comfort zone. Exactly. And so dealing with that own personal mistrust of yourself, of your client, but also knowing that clients in general until that therapeutic alliance is established, are going to have a mistrust about the therapeutic process anyway. And so we can't come in knowing that therapists are just going to buy into therapy because it's therapy and that's what they do for their job, but we still need to focus on aligning with our clients, joining with them, kind of really focusing on building that therapeutic alliance, understanding where the motivations are and where the goals are that isn't any different than any other client. But it takes a special care and a special attunement to wade through not only what your client is bringing in as far as transference about the process, but really dealing with your own counter-transference about where that competition might, mm-hmm. might line up. And I think also an over-identification can happen on the other end. So you can identify this is going to be the perfect client and they're going to know exactly how to behave and we can just go along. And then when that doesn't happen, then like, okay, let me teach you the basics because that's where I shine. I think there can also be on the opposite end, an over-identification. They already know everything that I know. They already, you know, they, there's something, you know, I don't have to go into the same level of detail as I would another client. And in truth, the training that we get is not uniform. The way we learn things is different when we're learning for ourselves or for our clients. And so there's been times that I've kind of gone to the assumption of, you know, I'm sure I don't need to go in this into this with you. And that assumption was poor. <laughs> that assumption was inaccurate. Like it was better for me to then be able to have the conversation and talk through those things and help and kind of observe, how do you understand this? Are you implementing this? What has worked for you? What's not worked for you? Versus assuming that this person is exactly like me and knows all the things I know because they're also a therapist. And, and I think that can happen with, you know, kind of do I do the basics or not kind of that question, but it can also happen ab- about our experiences of the profession. I mean, obviously each individual, there's individual demographics and, and socioeconomics and, you know, kind of stuff that's going to impact how we interact with the field as well as why we got into the work and, and how we've interacted with the systems. And I know when I first went into therapy with my therapist, it was clear, you know, she was not a fan of community mental health and I was struggling in community mental health, you know, and, and I do believe I'm still with her now. So I do believe she was able to overcome that bias and listen to me and be present with me. 
but it was something where she had a history, she had a, a you know, she had a knowledge and an assumption. And, and that was something that I think we had to kind of overtly talk about. And, and she did have to kind of dig in and ask the questions about whether or not I wanted to stay and what that looked like. Because for me, I assume I, I try not to, but when I'm when I'm working with clients, whether it's as a consultant as or, or as a therapist, I have to break through the assumption that this person's going to think like me, that they're going to want to do things the same way that I would, because I'm a therapist and they have similar goals that I do. And it's like you really have to step back. I mean, there can be a a, a big over identification and a and a assumption that can happen because you're treating someone that's in that same profession or potentially at a previous developmental stage or whatever in the profession you want to make sure that you're not doing that because i think whether it's assuming they know nothing and going to basic or assuming that either they're over aligned or know everything and and you can kind of go to shorthand or or push in a specific way i think any of those things where you're making assumptions based on their career i think is is harmful. Yeah, and I've noticed this with a handful of the therapists that have sought out therapy from me. And really, especially since we've got all of the things that we've got going on that I think a lot of people look to me as knowing a lot about our profession and understanding <laughs> things and being able to really put into practice a lot of the things that we talk about. And I'm really glad to have built that trusting relationship with them. And that being said, is my experience of therapists coming to me is the motivation to come and work with me is potentially different than a lot of the other clients. Mm -hmm. That there's a there's a push towards how to be more complete as opposed to necessarily solving a specific problem. Yes. Which inherently in and of itself leads to a longer term therapy. It's less about implementing basic practical skills of yeah. CBT worksheets and anything that's going to be, you know, time limited sort mm -hmm. of therapy. That is something that needs to be understood and needs to be again come to in the first couple of sessions as far as well what's really the goal that we're working towards here so that way we can align mm -hmm. but the one thing that i have really noticed out of almost all of my therapist clients mm -hmm. is as we're processing as we're discussing things is the jump to rationalizations that interesting the complaints about things the emotional responses that they have to their lives are yeah so i was really angry at my partner about this thing but i can see where he was coming from <laughs> and it's just you know it's this wonderful self cbt skill that a lot of people are, have mm -hmm. done but it doesn't change the feeling no and so i found that a lot of the work ends up getting therapists to actually respond to their emotions and to feel them and to feel them and to let those feelings be able to be arrived at recognized and to be able to move on rather than just kind of being this all understanding being for everybody else and sacrificing themselves to not have to be a flawed person in the process yeah yeah well i'm glad it's not just me <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I had a therapist, a previous therapist, tell me that it's it's okay to have feelings. So that was that was helpful. <laughs> well, and where I notice this is particularly for therapists who come to me for EMDR, one of the ways that we look at things in EMDR is what's cognition versus what's feeling. And a lot of my therapist clients tend to stick to the cognitive track through whatever it is that they're processing. And so a lot of where I end up directing them in those sessions is okay let's go to the feeling what's the feeling what are you noticing about your feeling that is something that they're not accustomed to because either through their work or through their previous self-therapeutic work is they've tried to come to this non-judgmental place for other people at the cost of sacrificing themselves say more about that so sitting in a room with a client, a therapist is typically trained to, okay, don't have your countertransference take over on the client. Mm -hmm. And so our internal process can end up being like shorthand here of, hey, the client maybe shouldn't have done that. 
like I'm having this judgment about them. I don't want this judgment to come out across them. So how can I see what they're doing? Oh, from their history, I can see why they might have made these decisions that then just becomes with practice, just kind of a lot more of, okay, I'm, I'm accepting of where the client is coming from in this. I'm putting my feelings to the side on this. But if we never go back to those feelings that we put on the side, then they just kind of tend to accumulate and accumulate. And so by getting therapists to break out of that habit when they're seeking out their own therapy, when they're the therapist client, yeah, it's teaching them to get into a different emotionality way of thinking that helps them to really be able to move through those feelings as opposed to just setting them to the side. I think that can in some ways speak to the roles of who's in the room, because I think... And this may be more so, I've always kind of avoided a group therapy setting for this reason, but I think I can, there's times I've felt this as a client in the room, and I've also sometimes felt it with therapists or other kind of helpers that are in this role kind of in the room. But this this idea of, I have to remain contained because messiness is inconvenient. And, you know, and as a therapist, we don't necessarily want to be messy, right? We don't want to have our feelings spew all over the room across the client. And, and we see that it's harmful. But I think when we don't take off that armor, like what you're saying, when we're in the safety of our own therapist room, then I think that that can be very problematic. And so I think it is very beneficial for therapists who are treating therapists to acknowledge that. Cause I think there are times that because I'm kind of a, an intellectualizer myself that I can, I can I can fall into these deep philosophical conversations that are laden with, you know, kind of intellectual insight <laughs> about a problem with one of my therapist clients, but when we but not getting to the feelings and not being able to process would be problematic. I think it's something that I'm, you know, continuing to work on, but I think it's that piece of not allowing your therapist client to run away with beautiful beautiful insight that doesn't touch their emotions at all. I think inherently as therapists, it feels safe to live in that intellect. That That's yeah. what got us through school. And a lot of therapists are just really good at school. And, yeah. <laughs> and so it's not assuming that they're able to practically apply the things that they've learned to themselves. And so sometimes this is, again, that balance of how much do they know versus mm -hmm. assuming what they know. But even being able to kind of simply point things out helps people sometimes just feel a like grounding back into, okay, here's where my intellect fits with what I'm doing. But sometimes it's also necessary once you get to know them and on that path to their goal of helping them be able to simplify it down into things that they do already know. For instance, being able to say, well, you know, now that I've known you for however many sessions it is, here's where in this process that that's falling apart. Here's where, you know, this is that attachment that's coming mm -hmm. up. Here's that anxious side of you coming up. Here's that avoidant side of you coming up that's dealing with this that helps them to put things more into real time or just even having that different perspective that allows for them to arrive at their conclusions. This is exactly the same as what we do with non-therapist clients. Yeah. But it's being able to take that personal and put it into where their skill set really is, which is knowing the therapeutic process. Mm -hmm. well, I think another aspect of that, I'm just kind of riffing on this a little bit more too, it's just this, this idea that if we're feeling uncomfortable as clients, if we're feeling overwhelmed and we don't see what, you know, the reason we've come to therapy is for that additional perspective, and maybe I'm just speaking to the fellow high achievers, but there's also this idea of like, if I can have this beautiful insight, if I can know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing, if I can lay that out on the table, then I will impress my therapist. And, <laughs> and my therapist will say, yes, you are brilliant. And it kind of pulls yourself back into that, that kind of contained powerful space versus the therapist then you know, kind of digging below that and, and moving to the side of that. And, and then also identifying this process of putting yourself into this, 
intellectualized role, but also the helper role, you know, the, it's, I don't know if I'm saying anything that's that different, but I think there's that, that kind of, it's not exactly competition. I, I always joke that I like, I want to be the best therapist, therapy client ever. And I think that there's, there's that, that aspect of the ideal of this great insight, someone that's super easy, that doesn't, you know, they're not getting messy. They're not pushing boundaries. Like, you know, there are going to be the clients who do push all the boundaries as therapists and, and have all the emotions and they do all these things. And I think there are also going to be clients who are trying to please the therapist and over identify with what the therapist is experiencing. And so not wanting to, you know, wanting to please the therapist. Mm -hmm. And so I think the therapist really pushing back and digging into the relationship and being able to cut through that can be very important. And I've experienced the other end of this too, which is this competition to be difficult enough to be compared with the worst of the clients on the case. <laughs> and it's that, that additional level of insight of what, what's going through the therapist's mind. Whereas our other clients are not going to think about what other clients do you have? I mean, maybe they will, but not in the same way of understanding what a caseload looks like, understanding what the therapy, therapy room and the, the hour looks like. And so we're sitting there going like, so I'm trying to be the best client. Are you saying you're trying to be the worst client? <laughs> so this has come up with some of my clients before, which is that, you know, people who are going through a very difficult experience or reprocessing something mm -hmm. that they thought that they've moved past before, but then just kind of like, oh, you must think that I'm, you know, one of your worst clients right now. And there's uh, that kind of know, the reassurance, <laughs> that reassurance. But it's also when you look at it, it's that seek for validation. Mm -hmm. And it's something where, you know, we talk a lot about that vulnerability that we encourage when it's done correctly as the therapist in the room that makes it hard for some of our therapist clients to seek out that vulnerability and that validation elsewhere in their lives. Because when that gets trained out of us, yeah, not only does that make therapy worse when you're performing it, but it also makes it harder to ask for it when you need it. Yeah, And having a good therapeutic response in those situations is really just kind of, okay, clients, you're a therapist. Let's talk about how our cognitions are working out right now and this need for validation right here. <laughs> it's not treating it differently than other clients, but it's seeing just kind of the extra layers of richness around what's leading to this particular mm -hmm. request that takes a patience to be able to really help therapist clients find what it is that they need. Because I think in that mistrust process, we as therapists know that there's nothing about this field that's easy. Yeah. And so it, as a therapist client, if we're sitting there and somebody is spouting advice of, okay, here's just how you solve the problem, we're even more likely to reject that than a client who's coming in. That we we love the process. We relish in the struggle, even as clients. And that's part of where we need the therapist therapist to hold that container. Yeah, and I think we also, you know, the continued caveat that each client is different and so kind of looking to see how they're operating. I've had therapist clients and potentially it's partially because of the consulting that I do, but have wanted to to kind of identify some specific strategies around decreasing burnout, it, you know, creating a career they can sustain, that kind of stuff where it does get very practical and it and it's looking at, you know, it's still kind of based in their in their situation. So it's not like you have to do it this way. <laughs> it is still a problem solving and an identification. But I think that each client is going to be coming for different reasons, coming in different configurations. And so I think the therapist being able to understand their best, you know, their scope of practice and competence and, and where they work best so that when you're in the room with a therapist who's seeking your expertise, that you can kind of ground yourself, be present, have the container and do the work that needs to be done versus feeling caught off guard because here's a therapist that is going to have an opinion on how we do our work. So another layer to this is when therapist clients bring up job aspects mm -hmm. and 
I hear about people's supervisors. I hear about people's bosses. I hear about their clinical directors, some of whom I know. And, <laughs> and needing to be able to separate out kind of my relationships with them elsewhere. But then there's also the exploration of aspects that come from their responses to clients and really understanding that there's certain aspects of that that as a supervisor having supervised people before it's mm -hmm. kind of like okay there's a line that i'm willing to go to and exploring somebody's response it counter transference response in supervision and then there's a part where i'm like okay now here's the part where you have to work on this in therapy yeah yeah and, and being on the other side of that is not getting into the specifics of what's going on with their client, but where that emotional response is really resonating or really getting awoken in in my client in the situation. Yeah, and and for me, you know, as far as like countertransference and and kind of what's gone beyond that into a therapeutic issue, certainly as a supervisor, I would recommend therapy, and and I've been able to have those conversations. And I think that work can often be very rich. I think for me, and I think it's just because of kind of where I've focused and specialized is just it's so often it's not about the client work for me when I work with therapists. It's often about the work itself, you know, the the work environment or the stress of building a business or the difficult boss or, you know, that kind of stuff. And so for me, there's that piece of wanting to be present for it without overlaying my own experiences or even kind of trying to figure out what the truth of it is. Cause I think with, with clients in other places, working in other environments, that kind of stuff, I try to take what they're describing at face value, try to get the context as best as they can try to, to challenge negative assumptions or positive assumptions if they're, you know, they're struggling. Whereas with a therapist and having been a supervisor and a manager, like there's times when I, you know, when I've had clients talk about the struggles they have, and I have to make sure that I don't doubt their experience mm -hmm. <laughs> and their ability to to kind of uh, to to assess what's actually happening based on where they are, because I know that there were times that were, there were folks who I'm sure were talking to their therapist about how great of a job they were doing and and why did I get fired? <laughs> and I'm sitting here going like yeah, there was a whole other side to that. So I think to me, I, again, and maybe I'm just repeating this, but kind of making sure that I'm not overlaying too much of my experience as a clinician mm -hmm. and the struggles that I had and how I had to rise up and, and fight the machine or when I became part of the, the infrastructure that I don't take, that I take enough of that because it's a, it is experience that is relevant, but I don't, ignore the, the what my client is actually saying and describing. So I think to wrap this up, the takeaway is, is that the therapist clients are a lot like other clients, mm -hmm. but totally different at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, and I think the, the, the biggest piece is that we need to recognize our experience and how that's going to impact how we interact with our clients. But a lot of what we're talking about is really do the work that you would do with any other client, which is meet them where they're at and understand them for who they are and not make and don't make assumptions. Yeah. And really to tune into what they want out of the therapeutic process and be able to adjust your end of the treatment to that. And sometimes that might be really helping them to actually sit back and figure out what it is that they want out of that process. But this is really starting with that therapeutic alliance of listening to what they want and determining the right path to get there. And sometimes, you know, as therapists, if you're seeking out therapy, there are going to be people that you run into that might not have the same skill set as you. I know some people try out different modalities of mm -hmm. therapy as clients just to try it out. Yep. But also being able to really verbalize for yourself what it is that you need out of therapy to help your therapist and therapists in this situation respond when your clients do actually tell you what they want and encourage them to to give you that information because i think a lot of people will take the lead from the therapist even if they are a therapist 
So we love getting the feedback about what we're doing in order to help us generate some ideas. If there's a topic that you'd like to have us cover, you can post it on any of our social media. You can join our Facebook group, the Modern Therapist Group. You can leave some contact email stuff from our website, mtsgpodcast.com. We're always open to your feedback and ideas. And while you're on our website, you'll see that we have our call for speakers for our Therapy Reimagined 2020 conference that's coming up here in September in the Los Angeles area. So if you have something that you'd like to propose for our conference, we'd love to run it by our committee. And until next time, I'm Kurt Whithelm with Katie Vernoy. Thank you for listening to the Modern Therapist Survival Guide. Learn more about who we are and what we do at mtsgpodcast.com. You can also join us on Facebook and Twitter. And please don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of our episodes. 